This will be a little bit of a departure from uh, how the channel usually goes, but uh, I was going to do this one a few weeks ago, and uh, I was able to dig out most of the ones I was looking for. The biggest, most important ones all had gone missing. It's like, oh God, what, what, what happened here? And I mean, I dug through everything up on these shelves here, trying to find where these things went, and by the time I was about to just give up completely on it, they were sitting right in this little spot right in here where they had always been. I just never noticed them because they were covered up by something else. So uh, on the plus side, I got some cleaning at least and some organizational kind of stuff done with it and a few other things. So I was real, I guess it turned out all right. And not sure if you can hear my cat in the background. Apparently she is off hunting there. So uh, fun times. Got the tribe game on behind me right now as well. You can see a little bit of that, I'm sure. I mean, just the very corner of it, I guess, there. But uh so yeah, let's take a look through some of these. I'll show you the uh, show you the ones that went missing first, and you can see just how how uh, kind of almost uh, disastrous it was that they went missing. But uh, back in God, this has been 1992. Uh, my grandfather died in 1991. He was what 88, almost 89 years old at the time, and uh, so my grandmother continued living in their house for about another year after that, and then went to uh, move to an assisted living facility. And so the last summer that she lived there. We went up to see her. She told us, hey, go through the house, um, take anything you want with you out of it, because anything that you don't take is just going to be staying there for whoever ends up buying the thing. So figure, all right, you know, we'll go through everything, get out whatever we can. And uh, so we decided, well, let's take a look up in the attic, see if there's anything up in there. And I'm thinking, well, I knew my dad was a big time card collector back when he was a kid. I mean, he said, he said the earliest ones he ever had were the 1955 Bowman ones, ones that looked like, you know, had the color TV design to them and everything. But, uh, I know that he had like nearly complete sets from like 57, I think he said it was about the first one, all the way up until somewhere around the early to mid 60s, so 63, 64, 65, somewhere around there. But um, he had gotten rid of them all years ago or so, he had said, and uh, so the chance of us finding them were gonna, it was going to be pretty slim, we figured. So I said, all right, you know, well, yeah, we'll, we'll see what we find, but... Uh, I was super excited, hoping we might, but uh, we went upstairs and into the attic, and yeah, found two bags of uh, 62 and 63 Topps cards that somehow had survived that. My grandmother said, you know, throw them in a bag, put them up in the attic, whatever, and so there we were, 1992, you know, 30 years later, finding these things. So that's where most of these cards are going to come from. Now, I'm going to go through the first few here of uh, that are outside of that area there. It's a guy named George Brunette. Uh, George Brunette was a long-time journeyman pitcher. He made his debut in pro ball with Shelby of the Tar Heel League in 53. He finally hung up the cleats after pitching about 12 years in the Mexican League in 1985. So that's 32 years of pro ball right there. And uh, at points in various wow. off-seasons... Wow, Jordan Luplo's not useless after all. Nice. All right. I like it. So anyways, George Brunette... Um, where was I with this? Oh, yeah, he lived next door to my dad during the uh, off-season, my dad and my grandparents. And so uh, there's actually a newspaper photo of my dad with him that if I can dig it up, I'll put it in right here. Hopefully I was able to find it. If not, that pause is very awkward there. But, uh, awkward. yeah, I think I found it, though. I'm, I'm hoping I was able to find it at least. So, anyways, so my dad tried to find, you know, all of Brunette's cards and... Uh, eventually was able to get all of his major releases and everything. And so, uh, yeah, like I said, we found, you know, those old 62 and 63s, found the old George Burnett's. And then when I went up to the National Sports Collectors Convention in 2014, as uh, I was like, just after the show had ended and I was, you know, getting ready to just spend a couple extra days up there, he says, oh yeah, hey, you can have all these and gives me all of his old 62 and 63s and the George Burnett cards. So that's how I ended up with all of these. I've gotten a few of them signed over the years, which I've shown off at times before. But right now we're going to show off the unsigned ones because this is where the big names start to come in. But uh, I've also got another binder full of them over there. I'm not going to bother with that. That's a lot of commons, guys that either are alive and not signing or who have already died. Um, it's a lot of smaller names, though. I'm going to go for the big ones. But yeah, let's go ahead and like, take a look at the uh, George Burnett ones first. There, This is a 58 Tops rookie card right there. Brunette, by the way, died in 1991 in Mexico, about uh, six years after retiring as a player. He'd been coaching a little bit through, I think, 89 or so, and then hung it up after that. 64 tops one right there as well. You'll notice a lot of different teams represented here. He bounced around quite a bit in his career. I mean, by the time the 64 card came out, he'd already pitched for the Kansas City A's, Milwaukee Brewers, Houston Colt 45s, and the Baltimore Orioles. After Baltimore, he bounced out to uh, the LA Angels. 
and finally found a home there. He actually pitched there for a number of years. You've got him on 65 there, 66 there. Um, fun ones here. We'll show you the 67 and the, uh, yeah, 67 and 69, which have the exact same photo on them. Nice job, Tops. In between those is the 68 there also with the Angels. Airbrushed hat, though, which is weird. It's like, guys, he's been with the Angels since 64. You're in 68 now. You couldn't have gotten a new photo of him in that time? Come on. So, anyways, got those. Um, 1969, he later went on to the Seattle Pilots for uh, part, of this, part of that loan season that they were around. And eventually went on to the Washington Senators to start the 1970 season. That's who he is right there. Fun story about him with the Senators. Um, like I said, Brent made his debut with the Kansas City A, or yeah, with the Kansas City A's. And this would have been back in '56, and one of the first games he pitched in was against the Boston Red Sox, and uh, comes in with this two-out bases loaded semi jam, I guess you could say there. But um, Brent's a lefty, so of course he's brought in to face a lefty. See if you can figure out who it was. 1956 Red Sox, left-handed hitter. With the bases loaded and they're bringing the lefty to get him out. Yeah, it was Ted Williams. Ted Williams was George Burnett's hero as a kid. And so uh, he said he didn't even realize until he had like an 0-2 or 1-2 count on Williams that, oh my God, I'm pitching to like the greatest hitter who ever lived. And he gets him to ground out to end the inning. The next day, uh, the teams are out taking batting practice. And as Burnett comes out of the field, uh, Ted's there and he looks at him and says, hey kid, you learn to keep that fastball down. You've got a long career ahead of you. And uh, well... In 1970 with the Washington Senators, who was the manager there, but Ted Williams. So, yeah, long career to say the least there. Uh, Brent finished out his career in 1971, okay, 70 with the Pirates. Then pitched, I believe, in 71 very briefly with the Cardinals before they released him. And then he went on to a couple more minor league seasons and then down to the Mexican League, where he is now a, a posthumous Mexican League Hall of Famer. Holds the record for most, I think he holds the record for the most strikeouts in all the minor leagues combined ever. Uh, holds the Mexican League records for strikeouts, shutouts, complete games, probably a couple other stats in there as well. But yeah, he's an absolute legend down there, Mexican League Hall of Famer. So there you go. So we'll go on first to, uh, we'll get into these 62s and 63s here a little bit. But uh, the biggest ones, like I said, I'm going to show the big ones. We'll just go straight into the big guns here off of this one. So uh, got these four right here graded. By this company called CTA that I don't think is around any longer. But the reason I did it through CTA was at the 2001 National, I got the uh, VIP pass there. And so they put in a, the CTA put this thing in there that had a graded Tiger Woods rookie card. Everybody who got the VIP pass got a uh, great one that was graded an eight. And CTA made a deal that if you get three cards graded by them, you can trade in that eight for one graded a nine. If you get five cards graded by them, you can trade it in for one graded a 10. And so, obviously, I did that and got the uh, went ahead and got the 10 right there. So, not sure what the value is on that or anything. I know Tiger Woods' stuff has gone kind of all over the place in terms of value. But, yeah, we'll see. Might trade it off somewhere, somewhere along the line. But with CTA, they did this weird thing where they put in these, uh, did these slips along with it that told, like, specifics on the grades and a damage assessment for each zone of the card, as they called it. But... This is what it looked like there. You can kind of get the idea off of that. As you can probably see from there, it's the, that's the first one I'm going to show you is uh, Roberto Clemente. Our Clemente ended up getting a 7 on it. But uh, I'm considering cracking the case and getting the redone by like BGS or PSA or somebody. But I don't know yet if I will or not. I'm a little squeamish about, you know, trying to pop these cases open and everything. And don't want to damage something like this. But at the same time, it's like I've, I've seen it done. I know it can't be too hard. I've got friends who could probably do it pretty well. So, but yeah, Robo Clemente, one of the big ones that we got in there. I got a seven, so not too bad. Uh, let's see, the very biggest one for us was coming across a 1962 Mickey Mantle, card number 200 right there. As you can see out of the centering is absolutely terrible there. The corner's not too bad. I mean, there's uh, one that's, uh, they're all a little bit kind of, you know, fuzzy and everything, but not too bad. There's a printing line at the very bottom. Aside from the centering, though, it came out pretty decent, and so for it to get a 5, it's like, eh, it might be able to get a little higher, I don't know. Not sure how bad, I mean, the centering obviously is pretty bad, so I'll knock it down, but, yeah. Uh, let's see here, we also got the 1963 Willie Mays Stan Musial Pride of the NL, also got a 7 from them. Once again, the centering on uh, top to bottom is bad. Side to side, that is great centering there, I mean, just take a look at that side to side right there. Looks great. Top to bottom, not so much. 
But um, yeah, this one also got a seven, which I think it might get a little higher than that. I mean, the corners are good, the edges are sharp. Yeah, that one might be able to get a little bit higher. So I don't know, we'll see about that. And the last one out of the graded ones, we actually got five graded, but only four came back slabbed, was the Bomber's Best from 1963, which has Tom Tresh, Mickey Mantle, and uh, Bobby Richardson on it. Centering also off a little bit top to bottom, not too bad side to side, a little bit of a rough corner down here. But yeah, you can kind of see there. And we had two of the Bomber's Best card, but we sent them in for grading, and one came back as ungradable. It said that the dimensions were off on it, which is weird because... It was actually too tall. It's like, that's weird, I guess. But uh, yeah, they said they wouldn't grade it because of that. So usually it's, you know, card gets trimmed or something like that. That's why they won't, won't grade it if it's, you know, off on the dimensions. But this one was too large. So yeah, okay. Not really sure. Uh, not really sure about that one. But hey, whatever. We still got it. And I'll show that off here in a minute. But you know, we'll get into the ones we didn't get graded now. So a small handful on these. So mostly Hall of Famers got like Ernie Banks, for example. And I might go ahead and, you know, get some of these done by uh, BGS or PSA at some point. Holding off on it for now, though, because, I mean, BGS jacked their prices up to 30 bucks a card for their base service. It's like, uh, for stuff I'm not going to sell, I don't know about that. I got Orlando Cepeda there as well. I'm trying to get this just right, tilting it here so it's not reflecting everything from across the room here onto him. Got Stan Musial as well in there. Stan the man. First one's a non-Hall of Famer. It's still a nice card here for anybody who's a fan of 60s and 70s baseball. And this would be the Boog Powell rookie card. Notice right there he's still listed as John Powell on it, his real name. Before they start putting his nickname on there. Which is ironic because, uh, of course, you know, Roberto Clemente, they list as Bob his entire career. And he absolutely hated that. If anybody tried to call him Bob, Bobby, Rob, anything like that, he would correct them and say, it's Roberto. Tops apparently missed that memo for about 15 years and called him Bob on their cards. He hated it, and I would too. Tops has a history of kind of doing that, though. I mean, if you look at all the cards of Tim Raines out there, they refer to him as Rock Raines forever. It's like, yeah, that's his nickname, but I've never heard it used totally, completely in place of his real name. So, yeah, I don't know. I've got Warren Spahn in here. It's kind of cool to get the Warren Spahn card because... Uh, he was my dad's favorite player when he was a kid, and it just so happens that I share his birthday. Of course, Spawn was born 63 years before me, but still, same day at least, April 23rd. Uh, of course, 62 set was the first one after Roger Maris broke Babe Ruth's home run record. And so for that, Topps did this uh, tribute to Babe Ruth with the Babe Ruth special cards in there. And so we got a bunch of those, including this one with Babe as a boy playing in Baltimore. Babe joins the Yanks. Who's that that he's with? Let's say... I think that's Colonel Jake Ruppert that he's with on that card. It's a card that has the famous slugger. Of course, there is the Gehrig and Ruth card there with him and Lou Gehrig. It's the most valuable one out of the uh, Babe Ruth special set. A Twilight Years card that features him showing with the Boston Braves. Part of him coaching for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Ruth had dreams of being a manager eventually, but no team was willing to take him up on that. And so, got in as a Dodgers third base coach, mostly as a bit of a publicity stunt more than anything. The greatest sports hero card, signing autographs for the kids. And the farewell speech card as well. Fortunately, doesn't have the bat there that he used as a cane that uh, belonged to Bob Feller. It took Feller a while to be able to get that bat back eventually. Not sure where it ended up or how it ended up there, but his, his I think it was his museum had to actually go and buy it to get it back, which is like, come on, whoever owns it, you should just donate the thing and let's, you know, show it off in the museum there and everything. You can still maintain ownership and let it be seen by the people, but yeah, whatever. Uh, another one's not a Hall of Famer, but pretty well known is the rookie card of Tim McCarver. Mostly known as a broadcaster, of course. I mean, he did play for, what, close to 20 years probably, but still... Me, at least. I think it was a broadcaster more than anything. Uh, second year, I believe, on this one, but it is, it's either a second year card or a rookie card. I forget if he had one in 61 or not, but Joe Torrey. It has the rookie cup on it, though, right there, when they had the big statue for it instead of uh, just the cup. Really kind of a cool-looking thing there. Kind of glad they shrank it down, though. It takes up a lot of space on that one. Of course, back then, uh, Topps did cards of every World Series game including putting the full box score on the back, a little blurb about it and everything. And so, got the uh, Maris wins it in the ninth for uh, game number three of the 62 series. 
And the Whitey Ford one, Ford sets new mark. As after game four. And a World Series scoreless streak to 32 consecutive innings. That's what the uh, what his new mark was that he set right there. The previous record was established in 1918 by a pitcher named Babe Ruth. Hmm. So Babe Ruth lost two records in the 61 season. Ouch. So that's about it for the 62 set. We've got a few 63s here as well. 63s, we had more commons than big names in there, but still a few nice ones here. I mean, we've got the Buck Blasters card, which features uh, Smokey Burgess, Dick Stewart, Bob Skinner, and Roberto Clemente all on it. So there's a few Pirates fans out there who like that one. Got one here. This is, I believe, the, let's see, 61, This will be the fourth card of Carl Yastrzemski out there. I have his 1960 rookie card somewhere in this stuff. I might try to see if I can break that out real quick. Oh, let's see, the second year, I believe, card of Bob Euchre. This is the first one that wasn't in a high number series, though, if I remember. I think a 62 was, like, one of the high numbers, so it's kind of tough to come across. But 63 there, still second year. Another guy who is a catcher, more famous as a broadcaster. Another Roger Maris World Series one. Uh, this one was the uh, Maris Sparks Yankee Rally from Game 3. And here's that other Bomber's Best card. And yeah, it's, whoa, yeah, that centering top to bottom is real bad. So who knows, maybe it was right at the very top of a uh, sheet or something. Just, yeah, I don't know. Either way, kind of miscut and everything, but still not too bad at all for, I mean, it's a card with Mickey Mantle from the 60s. I mean, you can't really go wrong with anything like that. So, but yeah, there you go. There's some of the older ones that I've got in here. I've got this, I got this whole box of graded stuff over here. I might show off a few of those real quick. I get these stacked. There we go. Stack them up, right? But yeah, let me see if there's any of these ones that are worth uh, showing off in this. Okay. The one set that I haven't uh, shown off yet, but I'm going to eventually. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I'm down to needing only, I think it's nine cards left to complete the set signed. And uh, one of the ones that I got was, uh, this was actually given to me, of all things, by a collector out there who knew I was working on the set. And he was showing it off in a group, and I'm like, oh, man, I need that Topps Total one. That's so cool. And he messages me. He's like, hey, uh, what, what's your address? And I'm like, dude, I don't have enough to trade for that. I can guarantee. He's like, no, I'm just going to give it to you. I got plenty of Iserman signatures. And so, bam, Steve Iserman was the uh, one that I got there from him. And So, yeah, that's uh, that was a huge, huge score right there. And uh try to remember it in the back of my mind, hey, pay it forward if somebody needs some help on something like that. So a um, couple of them that are uh, in here from... Just picking up cheap somewhere along the line. But, I mean, Jeff Bagwell and Pudge Rookies graded 9 that, uh... Mint grading service, I wouldn't trust their grades, though. Those definitely, when you look at them closely, are not 9s. But, either way, they're slabbed, they're Hall of Famers, they're, they're rookie cards. So, yeah. It's fun stuff, at least. Ah, uh, let's see here. A couple other bigger ones in the back here as well. These are more recent ones that I got done. Okay, maybe not recent. The Barry Bonds one here has been around a while. But that is a 9... 1987 tops bonds rookie right there. Centering only got an eight and a half, but the corners, edges, and surface all got nines. So pretty happy with that. I mean, it was the best that I had out of any of them that were in there. And even the centering, I mean, it says centering is eight and a half. I guess kind of the top to bottom centering is a little bit off in there, but not uh, not horrifying at least. I mean, yeah, solid nine for sure. That's one that I could even consider probably cracking and regrading, but I'm good with a nine. It's not like it's, you know, a multi-hundred dollar card or anything like that. So, pretty happy with that. Uh, let's see here. Everybody's probably got their card that they look at and they go, oh, God, why did I why did I invest in that guy? But, um, yeah, this is back around, uh, you know, 1999, 2000. It was, uh, there, you know, a lot of big-name rookies that were going to be, well, big-name rookie quarterbacks coming out. I mean, you had, what, quarterbacks went top three in the 99 draft. Plus, I mean, I think there were two more in the top 15. And so, Figure, oh, hey, I got a chance to snag a gem mint 9-5 of this guy. Oh, hell yeah, we'll take a Cade McNown. Ooh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, 20 years later, there's a little bit of regret there, I gotta say. I mean, hell, five years later, there's a little bit of regret there, but a um, couple of those. I mean, once in a while, though, too, you get a nice find, such as this one, which got a centering grade of 9, edges of 9, corners 9-5, and surface 9-5. This one I got graded about a year ago. It came back like that, and it is Ken Griffey Jr.'s 89 Upper Deck card. Pretty happy with that one. I mean, 
centering and edges only got nines, which is kind of weird. I mean, the edges look just fine from what I can tell. I mean, I guess maybe, you know, a little bit on the top there, but I mean, hey, great corners, great surface. And the crazy thing is when I took this to a card shop over in Plano, to have them take a look at it and see, you know, is this worth grading? The thing they said was it's probably going to get knocked down on the surface because of the hologram there. Maybe you'll see the very top has just a little bit of not quite perfection there at that that top corner, but it got a 9.5 on the, on the surface. I mean, you can't really, can't really do much better than that. It's kind of funny how I came across this one. There was a woman who used to set up a table outside of Fenway Park during uh, right before Red Sox games, usually during the first couple of inches, stick around there as well. And uh, just sold all sorts of packs, mostly. It's old, just any kind of old packs. I mean, I've found like some, you know, 82 and 83 tops ones that she'd had there. 89 upper deck ones as well. And so I figured, you know, once it's like, all right, I've got an extra 10 in my pocket. Why not? Let's take a chance on an 89 upper deck pack. So I get it, you know, and start walking off, open it up, look through it. And right in the middle of that pack was the Griffey rookie. And I'm just like, freeze dead in my tracks very carefully, slip back in. And I go over and I'm like, do you have a sleeve or a top loader? Because I just pulled the Griffey rookie. I was just like, yep, there you go. Take it. Well done. Congratulations. And yeah, just stayed in there for the next uh, 15 years until I got it graded about a year ago. And so, yeah, pretty happy with a nine, though, on it, I got to say. I mean, just half a point away, though, from getting the uh, from getting up, bumped up to a 9.5. But yeah, I'm not going to complain much about that. Last one is a uh, 1911 T205 card. Very poor conditioning. I mean, yeah, just got a one on it, but... I mean, you got to slab this thing just to protect it and everything, and so that's exactly what I did there, but here's the uh, Thomas Downey card from in there. Found by my in-laws at a, uh, like a flea market or something like that, and so they picked it up and said, hey, here you go, Merry Christmas, and so I've had that there in my collection for a while. So, let me see here if there's any other ones that are worth uh, pulling out on here. Um... Might be a few oddities and such here and there. Oh yeah, this one's always a fun one. Uh, for the hockey collectors out there, 1991 score, of course, had a few uh, big name rookies in it. Hall of Fame guys like uh, Marty Brodeur, um, Eric Lindros, Yarmir Yager has a rookie card in there. So here's the Brodeur one. But keep that in mind when you flip it around to the back and you see that's Bruce Driver on the back of it. That's, that's, that's not Marty Brodeur. That's not the back of his card. So... A wrong back Marty Brodeur rookie card. Um, I've considered getting this one graded too. I put it up for sale to try to get some offers on it. Um, didn't really get much of anything. A lot of people that were interested in watching it and stuff, but nobody who uh, actually took a chance and bought it. But I picked this one up at a card show back in the early 2000s. I think it was like five bucks I paid for it. The uh, Brodeur rookie itself was booking for about five at that time as well. So it's like, you know what? Five bucks for an error like that? Yeah, we'll take a chance on that. And so... Kind of been holding on to that here for a couple of years at this point. Stuff sliding around here a bit. Oh, I'm trying to think. Let's see if there's any other oddities and fun rookies or anything like that. I've got a uh, got a good size Yarmir Yager collection that I used to. Uh, I used to be a huge Yager fan collector back, kind of in the late '90s, early 2000s. Kind of gave up on that after he demanded to be traded out of Pittsburgh, and then then went and told Pittsburgh he'd be that they would be sorry for trading him. It's like. You don't get to have both of those things, dude. Come on, that's that's insane. But uh, yeah, let's see here. Um, that's a big old thing right here of random stuff and top loaders. Might be a few in here worth showing off. I think that's might be where my Yaz rookie ended up. Is somewhere in there. Uh, let's see here. It's all kind of assorted randomness of all different sports in here. But uh, there's some that I've looked into possibly getting slabbed whenever I go back to uh, getting stuff graded again. The great thing is, I mean, right now I'm trying to hold off on it because um, usually I can take stuff down to Beckett because it's only, you know, like a 15, 20, 30 minute drive from here. But um, right now they're not taking any in-person stuff because of COVID. So I don't have to pay for shipping and insurance and all that stuff when all it would usually have is a 30 minute drive for me. So I'm holding off on all that, hoping that maybe some price will go down. Maybe I can get in on some... Uh, bulk opportunities if I have to mail them in, something like that. Just anything I can do to drive the price down, basically. But uh, let's see, looking through here. I was like 90 and 91 Pro set, and you get these, you know, hidden gems like Brett Favre and Emmett Smith's rookie cards are in those sets. Probably not worth a whole lot, but they're fun ones to hang on to, at least. I mean, Hall of Famer's rookie card, you really can't go wrong with that. I was hoping to get this one signed, because uh, Peyton Manning, of course, signs for... Uh, 
fairly small donation cost, but apparently he does not sign rookie cards, unfortunately, which is too bad because I've got that score. I also have his Topps rookie card right here at the very end. I'm considering getting that Topps rookie slabbed, though. Uh, let's see. Not a whole lot in here. Ah, there it is. Um, said I had the Yaz rookie card right there. That's where that one's at. Not the greatest condition, but I mean, picking it up at a garage sale for like, what, 20 bucks, I think it was. Not bad. I'll take that any day. It's one that I know my dad has said that he used to have when he was a kid. So it's like, hey, cool. Kind of get to get that one back. Uh, let's see. Got a few others like the Ryan Sandberg Opeachy rookie right there. I'm considering getting that one graded. I mean, it's not the greatest condition. It's got a very rough top edge on it. The centering is terrible. So, you know, five bucks to get it signed. I might, I'd, I'd say I'd probably go for that. So considering that one. Um, 87 Donruss, 87 Tops. Several other Griffey rookies like Bowman. Um, and I've got his uh, upper, or not his, well, I showed his upper deck one. I know I've got his Donruss one somewhere. i got the Fleer one here, the score. Tops traded. Yeah. Consider getting this one graded too, but I haven't seen any prices on what it goes for at all when graded. But uh, Derek Jeter, free rookie card right there, right after he was uh, drafted by the Yankees. Goes in with the Gulf Coast League Yankees there. Senior at Central High School in Kalamazoo, Michigan. He was like 460 hitter with four home runs, 18 RBIs. Uh, let's see here. By the way, here's the regular Brodeur rookie front and the normal back on it now. Let's see. A whole bunch of hockey rookies, a lot of low end stuff though in these. Um, yeah. There we go. That's the ones I was looking at grading, possibly. They're going to be at the end of this. Yeah, considering send, I would considered sending these off to be graded, and I'm not sure. I probably won't, but we'll see. But, like, Barry Sanders, 89 Pro set. Got the uh, Alexander Ovechkin MVP rookie right there. Definitely doesn't go for quite as much as his, uh, the regular upper deck issue there with the uh, young guns, but still. Uh, Wayne Gretzky, this is not a rookie card, but still it's, you know, early career card. Decent shape that it's in there, but... Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to go about slapping that one or not. Probably not. This one I'm definitely giving consideration to, and it's the rookie card of Mike Gartner. It's the Capitals team leader, so it's technically not his true rookie card, but it is from his rookie season, and it is the unscratched version of it as well. So that would, I would hope, potentially command a premium. I don't know if I pulled this one out of a pack or what exactly, but uh, top to bottom centering is real bad. Side to side is decent. Um, yeah, it's a possibility. I might go for that one. Let's see. Yeah, there's that Don Ross Griffey rookie that I mentioned. Uh, let's see. So these ones, yeah, so I think after this were the ones I was considering slabbing. So uh, probably will end up looking into getting the, uh, yeah, like I said, the, you know, the upper, the tops Peyton Manning rookie. Got the uh, regular upper deck base set Kobe Bryant rookie as well. Actually got that one at a garage sale. This guy had this huge box. It was like, you know, remember those old, uh, computer printer paper boxes that they used to sell that had, you know, this whole giant box of like the end-to-end -end connected perforated paper and stuff. Had a box that size that was just loaded with cards. It was mostly 97 tops, but there's a lot of other 97 stuff in there. A little bit of upper deck, some score, some Fleer, a little bit of Don Russ in there as well. Even some of the uh, Leaf signature series, so a few autographs that came out of that box too. But um, the Kobe Bryant rookie card was right in there and... Uh, I mean, just looking at it, when I was checking it out, uh, prices of it on eBay, even ones that are graded at like an 8 are still going in the hundreds. Like, yeah, we're, 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 we're going to have to consider that one for sure. So, um, got a Joe Sackick rookie that's in pretty decent shape here. Centering seems to be pretty good all across. Corners are nice. That's probably going to get slabbed. And then, of course, I mean, who's the hottest name in sports collectibles right now but Patrick Mahomes? And so, got three... Various rookies of his, I'll probably try to see if I can get slabbed there. Play off the rookie Gridiron Kings and the, uh, what is this, Prism Optic. Donruss Optic Illusions there with Len Dawson. Who's the second hottest name in football right now? Probably Lamar Jackson. And so we've got these rookies there, two score and two select. I'll probably look at trying to slab those. And this uh, pretty nifty looking Brady blue prism. I don't know what kind of prism that is. Got the circles going on there with it. Not sure if you can see it on the... Here. See, if I can, see how close I can get and 
yeah, but I mean, it's numbered to 99 on the back, 59 out of 99, so to me that's, yeah, probably worth slabbing as well, so uh, a few of them considering getting done there at the very least, so yeah, there you go, some uh, random cool stuff, I might have some more to show you on next week's one, um, I actually recorded a few of these a few weeks ago, and the camera quality was so terrible on it that it's like, you know what, we're just going to redo those, and so uh, try to redo those next week as well, but right now, hope you liked all of these, and uh, Hopefully have some more for you here coming up soon. Thanks for tuning in. Hit that subscribe button. They'll find right down somewhere in this area below me. Somebody pointed out to me which side it was on. I'm forgetting again now because I tend to do that. But yeah, it's below the screen or below, below the video here. Hit that subscribe button. Get all the updates on anything I'm showing off, on any uh, TTMs I get in, anything like that. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.